Hey everyone! Before we begin today, we want to give a huge shout out to our newest patron, Clow. Welcome to the team. If you want to be like Clow and get access to our notes, outtakes, and more bonus content, head on over to patreon.com slash pod and prejudice. And now enjoy part five of our discussion of the 2008 mini series of Sense and Sensibility with our guests, Zoe and Kelsey of Tea and Strumpets. This is Becca. This is Molly. We are here to talk about Jane Austen. We are here specifically to talk about the second part of the second part of the sometimes three part, sometimes two part. 2008 adaptation of Sense and Sensibility. I really love saying that. I, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. That was just absolutely brilliant the way you just said that. <laughs> thank you so much. It just came to me in the moment. I feel like that's possibly the biggest mouthful you've had. <laughs> that is because I, I always make more of a mouthful out of it than I need to, but I decided to just really go the extra mile. So thank you all for appreciating it. Um, we are here joined today again by Zoe and Kelsey of Tea and Strumpets. Hello and welcome back. Hello, thanks for having us again. So if you want to know a little bit about Tea and Strumpets and Kelsey and Zoe and their work, you should definitely go back and listen to the last episode where you can learn all about it. Uh, I don't know why you would be starting with just the second <laughs> half of an adaptation of Sense and Sensibility. I do encourage you to at least start at the beginning of this adaptation. But regardless, that would be where you find it. And we are just to London, which is really where... Um, this is an explicit pod, so shit hits the fan, I would say. It does. I mean, should we just dive right back in? I absolutely think we should because it's about to get good. It is about to get so good. So we've arrived in London, and first things first, Mrs. Jennings' servant is named Foot in this, which is phenomenal because in the 1995, her servant was named Pigeon, and I just can't get enough of the different weird names for Mrs. Jennings' servants. Was it foot or was she, is that like a slang term for footman? That's what I wanted to know. No, she said this is foot. Oh. I don't think it was footman because I think foot was the butler. Okay. And maybe I didn't catch the introduction because at some point I definitely heard Marianne say like, foot, will you take this letter, you know, two penny post. And so I just thought she was like, that was a weird like Regency term for footman that I'd never heard. Anyhow. It wasn't. I see. <laughs> no, no, but your your way makes more sense than his name being yeah, foot. Exactly. So yeah, you know, it's possible that in fact it is weird slang, and she just calls him that. But I feel like that's not a Mrs. Jennings move. It actually could be a Mrs. Jennings move. But I love that his name is Foot. I screamed. I did. <laughs> she shows the Dashwood sisters to their rooms, and Marianne immediately starts writing a letter. Meanwhile, Mrs. Jennings shows Eleanor one of Charlotte's works of art. And I have to say, this is maybe my favorite moment. She says, seven years at a great school in town, and that's all we have to show for it. Poor Charlotte. That was absolutely my favorite line of the whole thing. Because uh, <laughs> you guys have that as like a question to prepare yeah. for. So that was it. It was so well <laughs> delivered. I laughed out loud. And it's just like the pause that she does before. Poor Charlotte. Yeah, <laughs> it's just so telling. It's so good. This is Jenning just like giving shade to her daughter, like in the nicest possible way. But she's just like, poor Charlotte. And I'm just like, and when you when you meet Charlotte, she's just so happy. Like she's a nice lady. And Miss Jenny's like, oh, poor Charlotte. <laughs> and she's done okay for herself. I mean, Mr. Palmer is what he is, but at least <laughs> she's gotten herself. A wealthy husband. Hey, and she produced an heir. So, you know, she's fine. Exactly. So Marianne immediately gives the letter that she has written to Foot. And at supper, Marianne is like looking out the window and Mrs. Jennings like, you know, you can stop looking. It's not going to make him come any faster. And it's probably too late for visitors anyway. But then there's a knock upon the door and Marianne is like, oh, it must be Willoughby. I know it is. In comes Colonel Brandon and Marianne just is so distressed that she leaves the room immediately. Oh, Marianne. Colonel Brandon just really likes to turn up. I'm not going to lie. He's just like, and I'm here. And every time at dinner, it's like, oh, look, it's Colonel Brandon. Oh, look, it's Colonel Brandon. I was like, that dude's in here a lot. <laughs> well, he he likes them. I know he does. He's so sweet. Yeah. He comes in and Mrs. Jennings is like, oh, like I hope your urgent business all worked out okay. And he gets really intense and he goes, what's done is done and <laughs> <laughs> so cryptic yeah at this point I thought that they had already had the duel and that he had like stabbed Willoughby oh no no, no. 
no, no, no. The duel is coming. Yeah. Yes, it sure is. He says that he needs to talk with Eleanor in in private. So Mrs. Jennings leaves and he asks if Marion and Willoughby are definitely engaged. And oh, my only note that I wrote on it is, quote, obviously this scene is perfection. Really? So because this is the scene where he delivers the line about endeavor to deserve her. Yeah. Um, and like, I'm sorry, but Alan Rickman like did that line epically, perfectly. Like, I don't think you can do that line after it's been done in Alan Rickman's voice. So it just didn't, it did not land for me. I was like, oh yeah, that is a, it, that is a really beautifully written line, but yeah, it's just, you're not Alan Rickman, dude. Yeah, that's totally fair. I want to say, I think I agree with you that he did not deliver that line to Alan Rickman's standard of perfection. Um, I think what, what sparked me to write that line is that this scene is so beautifully written on Jane Austen's part. Yeah. And it's the, you know, the tension that's there with him being like, is it really settled? And Eleanor being like, I can't tell you for sure, but I know that the love is really there and him like accepting that. Yeah. Um, it's true that Alan Rickman did this scene better. I will concede that. <laughs> I do love Alan Rickman. So you're you're slowly convincing me. <laughs> oh, so you're doing me such a mitzvah right now. <laughs> I do what I can. <laughs> yeah, you're doing the the hard work. The you're really getting in the trenches there. So that night, Eleanor is like, you know, Brandon was sad he didn't see you. He has great affection for you, and Marianne says, yeah, and I I have great affection for him, but he has one great defect. He is not. Willoughby. I mean, very clear. um, And I get it. I empathize with her in that moment, you know, that like she's she's trying to be like, you know, at least kind to Brandon uh, in her thoughts and her feelings. But he is not Willoughby. She's blinded by a pretty face. She's she's young. She's a romantic. She's sexually turned on. (laughs) Yeah. And as we learn, like they their chemistry is real. Their attraction is real. They're love might not be real but you know all of the things that that you know contribute to love are real yes I will also say that in this moment I felt that Marianne was a self-aware queen and I appreciate that they're like allowing that she knows that this is maybe you know not the wisest version of events that could take place like yeah she has a very good option right here Colonel Brandon but he's not the guy she has a crush on. So, well, and her crush also is like, you know, he's got an inheritance and he's like, you know, there's a house that could be hers that's big and nice. Like, totally. Willoughby is a catch. Like, he's young and handsome and has money coming to him. So, like, it's, it's not like he's a completely irrelevant option. Exactly. Yeah. At this point, he's a good option. Then we have a montage of Marianne waiting for letters and, you know, like <laughs> thinking she sees Willoughby in town and writing letters and asking if there's letters for her. Finally, a letter does arrive, but it's not for her. It's for Mrs. Jennings and it's inviting them to an assembly. And she says, oh, and the Miss Steeles will be there. And we see Eleanor's face kind of fall a little bit, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. Have you ever like secretly hated someone? Yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Secret beef is the worst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like. Yeah, there's definitely, definitely some secret hate. I think growing up in the 90s and 2000s, like we've all secretly hated someone who we had to associate with, Mm -hmm. you know, and like hopefully the culture is changing a little bit for kids in the next generations. But like, no, it's worse because now everyone gets hurt feelings and now you have to invite everybody in the class to your birthday party and you can't just invite your five best friends. Is it? Yeah. I had kids like granted this is like Silicon Valley, like prep school fanciness, like of these kids, but like a bunch of my former students, the mom was like, yeah, like you can't pass out like you can't just invite some of the kids in your class you have to invite the whole class so we have to have more than just like 10 people there and I was like my mom like 10 was my limit always because we weren't throwing a party for more than 10 people (laughs) all right well this is a podcast of its own so (laughs) yeah (laughs) anyway so speaking of parties wow what a segue um (laughs) we get to the party and there's fireworks going off and it's a huge party and Eleanor's like Marianne come on like I gotta fix your hair and Marianne's like I don't care and she like runs inside which is a you know, another way in which Willoughby has affected her like level of decorum. Um, And she's like, I just want to see him. They get inside and they see the Miss 
steals right away. And <laughs> Anne comes over and she's like, oh my God, there are so many bows here and they're, they're, they're so like all over us. Look at the nasty beasts, how they preen and ogle. And she's like, <laughs> she's like fanning herself. She's like, it's so hot. I love that. She was so- she was great. I loved her. Like when she did that, she's like, oh, look at them. Yeah. Look at them. Look at us. <laughs> yeah. I love her. And Steele is an icon. Justice for Anne. Justice for Anne, honestly. <laughs> Lucy starts freaking out because she's heard that Mr. Ferrers is here. And she's walking with Eleanor. And Fanny comes up and introduces them to her brother, Robert Ferrers. And This Robert Ferrers, first of all, he looks a little bit like the guy from the 95. They did the same thing where there was a really hot Edward and they got a brother who looks vaguely like him, but like much uglier. Well, isn't that how he's described in the book? No, Edward's supposed to not be that cute. (laughs) Oh, see, I think that like, like Hugh Grant is a very handsome man, but I think like he plays up the kind of like the not as attractive man in that version, like better than Dan, like Dan Stevens. I'm so sorry. You're just like, you, you are a beautiful human being. Like he's too hot. You're too hot for Edward. And then he has this kind of effervescence to him and to Edward's character that is just like, like maybe a touch more that, that, than it like is quite necessary to have. And so like, I don't know. I, I don't know what to tell him. He's just, he's too, too beautiful, too perfect. I just don't, I don't even understand how his mom could ever revoke his money because he is literally like too perfect of a, of a human being to look at. And I feel like she would just be fine with no matter whatever he did, because he was just, she created that. And then she was like the epitome of a Regency mama for that. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) She should be proud. She created perfection in him, but I will say like the first half, I was very much on team. Like Dan Stevens is too hot to be Edward. Like everyone, all of our listeners were like, just wait. Cause I, I'm a Hugh Grant stan to the end. And all of our listeners were like, just wait till you meet Dan Stevens. And I was like, I don't care about Dan Stevens. I didn't know who he was before this, but <laughs> then knowing who he is now, I'm like looking back at all the things I've seen him in. And I'm like, yes, he's, he is the sexiest man alive. But like he, in the first part, he's too hot, too flirty to be Edward. In this part, he definitely gets more, awkward and bumbling and like oh fuck I really fucked up um he gets that side of Edward a little bit more but he's still effervescence is a good word for him it's amazing that he conveyed that to you in all of his eight lines in this second part (laughs) yeah right he's like everyone there's a lot of talk of Edward but there's not a lot of seeing of Edward (laughs) yeah we get the wood chopping and we get the you know the end basically but yeah, we haven't even gotten to Edward. We're on Robert. So. That's true. Okay, so we meet Robert, and he turns to Eleanor, and he, I highlighted all the things that could be my favorite lines this time, and this is one of them. He said, quote, my brother has spoken very highly of your beauty. He is generally a po- very poor judge of these things, but in this instance, I have to concur. <laughs> and Eleanor is like, uh, thanks. It's such a backhanded compliment. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's such a backhanded compliment. And then and Lucy's right there, too. So then Eleanor is like, Okay, thanks, I guess. Uh, do you, have you met Lucy? And Robert is, like, really gross. He, like, starts, like, biting his lip. And, like, ew, 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 ew. Robert was like, I was like, no, no. Mm-mm. I felt like it was a much more natural chemistry that was displayed in the 95 version between Lucy and, and Robert, where, like, somehow when they first met, like, you just felt like they were two peas in a pod. Right. And so, like, when, you know, things happen at the end, you kind of go like, oh, well, they actually, like, really. But anyhow, uh, maybe I don't know how that is in the book, if it's more like. So fun fact about the book um, in the book, they don't meet at this party. This scene is basically stolen from the 95 because huh. the uh, 95 is so iconic that they do take certain things from the 95. Interesting. And pop it in here. I don't believe they meet here. No. And and also there's no I mean, when it was Robert at the end, it was so out of the blue in the book. So the fact they add this flirtation in in both the 95 and the 2008 because they need the audience to like catch on or like not be totally blindsided at the end. I still didn't catch on. So yeah. And it's because he's gross in this one. And I actually like this a little bit better than them actually having chemistry because the way he is grossly flirting with her would make no one want to actually date him. And the fact that in the end she's like, yeah, I guess I'll just marry him for his money is like. That was her end game the whole time. I just didn't understand how the mom didn't revoke the money from him. 
like in this. Because the mom hates Edward. <laughs> she irrevocably puts it on Robert so she can't take it back. Oh, okay. And Robert's her favorite. So it hurts more. But then she forgives him later. Yeah. Mm. And she had liked Lucy sort of, right? Anyway. Lucy like- has an uncanny knack for sucking up to high class people who are full of themselves. She knows how to play the game. Exactly. Funnily enough, in the books, Robert actually is quoted after Edwards found out saying something along the lines of, you know, my brother's always been an idiot with girls. I don't know how he was stupid enough to get that little like slutty, ugly girl after him. I would never be that dumb. And then like ends up marrying her later. (laughs) I wanted to find where Edward says that. Oh, yes. here, Here it is. He says, about their marriage, Edward says, she will be more hurt by it, for Robert was always her favorite. She will be more hurt by it, and on the same principle will forgive him much sooner. But I also, on this page, is the letter from Lucy to Edward telling him that she's run off with his brother. And it is the funniest thing, because she makes it about him instead of her being like, I'm a gold digger. She says, I know that you've always been in love with Eleanor anyway, so I'm freeing you now. She is the benevolent woman, like, bestowing this honor upon him. Yeah. (laughs) Pod and Prejudice is sponsored again this week by Romantically Written. Romantically Written mails weekly letters telling stories of Regency-era love and romance. With your subscription, you'll get a Jane Austen-style story told in 26 letters delivered straight to your mailbox. What I love is that the letters are hand calligraphed, then printed on parchment and finished with a wax seal to give them a super authentic look. And then they get mailed in a pink parchment envelope so that they stand out in your stack of mail. We've been sponsored by Romantically Written in the past, so I've been reading along with the story for a while now, and I can tell you firsthand that it's a lot of fun. It's like reading an Austen novel exclusively through the letters the characters send each other. It's the perfect gift for Jane Austen fans or just a gift to give yourself. And as our listeners, you can get 10% off your subscription when you use the code HOOMST. Check them out at romanticallywritten.com or on Instagram at romanticallywrittenletters. Then, after we've met Robert Ferrers, Marianne sees Willoughby across the room. And he sees her and he runs away like a weenie. And she starts chasing him through the hall. And Eleanor is like, come on, come on. No, 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 no. Let's like, he's, he, if he sees you, he'll come say hi. And Brandon is watching this all with eyes like a hawk. And then she like chases Willoughby upstairs and calls out his name. I was so upset for her. I was embarrassed for her. I was like, oh God, no, 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 Marianne, no. It all went silent. Everyone turns to look. It's so embarrassing. And he goes to talk to her. And this is where I was like, oh, I have no sympathy for him. He's acting like he's mad at her in this one. Like as if she's done something wrong and he's embarrassed to be seen with her. And he's like, yeah, like he he doesn't talk to her at first. He's like, hi, Eleanor. Like, how's your mom? How long have you been in town? Blah, blah, blah. And she, Marianne's like, what? is the meaning of all this. Like, did you get my letters? He's like, yeah, I got them. Excuse me, gotta go. And he turns away. And she's like, Eleanor, go to him, go to him. And then she swoons a little bit and she starts to fall over. And who should swoop in to catch her but our boy? When I tell you, I was watching this with, again, my boyfriend, and he is quite the rom-com skeptic. He's usually more of a comic book movie type, a zombie movie type. When I tell you that he fully swooned when Colonel Brandon (laughs) caught Marianne like a little girl. (laughs) Yeah. So did I. So did I, Mike. Yeah. The the whole, when the girl is like light as a feather and she's spirited away by the the, the handsome, strong hero. I mean, there's just something about that. Oh my God. The gentleness with which he carries her out of there. But, 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 but the way he is glaring at Willoughby and you're like, I know they're about to sword fight. And in fact, they do. Oh, my gosh. And then it was so funny because I didn't even need to know what is happening. They like after this, like it cuts to like the misty morning. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I looked at John and I was like, we have a duel. He's like, (laughs) wait, what? And he's like, are they actually doing this? And I was like, yes, babe, this is a thing. And he's like, wait, what? (laughs) He's like, why are they doing this? And I was like, because Willoughby is a scoundrel. He's a rake. He's a rake. He's a rake. I was wondering, does the duel happen in the book? Oh, yes, it does. (laughs) And is the duel about uh, Colonel Brandon's ward? Or is it about Marianne? Or is it about both? 
I think it's mostly about the ward. It would make sense more about the ward, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I feel like he should. There's no real necess- like he doesn't have any confirmation to to need to defend Marianne's honor other than the scenario that like happened just there, which was not great. But, you know, he doesn't know that they had an understanding. He has no confirmation about that. So so I, I felt like the positioning of the duel right after that scene was a little ambiguous in that respect, which maybe that was the directorial choice. I think in the book, the duel now, correct me if I'm wrong and I might be, but I feel like the duel happened right after Brandon found out about his ward's child. Like, we don't actually see it happen, but he tells Eleanor about it later on. And she's like, oh, men with their guns. Was it a gun duel also in the book? They don't specify. In the book, it's sort of like an offline where I almost said Alan Rickman, but Colonel Brandon sort of (laughs) defends Eliza's honor. And he mentions something to that, like doing so as a man. And then it mentions something along the lines of like Eleanor suppress the urge to like roll her eyes at the way that men sort things out so you know it's a duel but it's like a three-line endeavor and you were like I want more and I was like you'll not get it in the 95. See I don't know I mean and I don't know how much you guys end up talking at the end about like you know the cinematography or like the actual production of it is that something you guys like to discuss at the end? We can talk about it now. Okay um I hated the duel. I hated the way it was shot. I thought it was like really (laughs) janky. I was like, what is going on? Um, There was a lot of weird cuts and fades to black, which I've watched a lot of like British shows, BBC shows. So it's not like I have no idea what this like style is. No, you're totally correct. The duel is high drama and it's totally ridiculous in this and the way that they use the wax marion is sealing her letter with, like blood make you think that <laughs> willoughby's gotten his throat slit i just i was like okay guys like I, I I like a duel where, you know, we've got some duels even in Bridgerton recently, you know, and, and I, I think I remember liking the duel scene or maybe I didn't. Oh, oh right. anyhow, the point is, uh, yeah, I was not into the, the cinematography or the fades to black. It was just like it actually felt to me like this was made earlier than the 95. Mm. And I get it. One's a miniseries and one is like a big, you know production movie production those are different types of filming but I really felt like this scene especially kind of epitomized it for me where I was just like I wish you had I wish you could you know I think you could do a lot with a small budget and I think that they didn't here I don't I don't even know what the budget for this film or for this miniseries was but I felt like nah I feel like you all have similar feelings about the duel. I will play the devil's advocate. I had a great time. (laughs) Um, Just because I think I've come to accept about the BBC miniseries, and I've only seen this one in Pride and Prejudice, but they are so corny and so over the top. (laughs) And I've just come to accept that about them. There's always like a weird shot of like under the carriage as the carriage trundles along the countryside and you're like well, what's gonna happen is the oh, carriage gonna upend there was there was some weird like weird filming with carriages this time that I was like oh my god I'm getting motion sick for no reason yeah I loved how much the carriage was bouncing around and then when they have the scene in them they're like barely jostling and I was like <laughs> dang that must be some good springs on that coach right right <laughs> But like, and in the 1995 Pride and Prejudice, there's a weird scene where Elizabeth looks out the window and Darcy's head is just floating there, like repeating his proposal to her and like all of these things. I'm like, okay, it's just corny. And so I totally accepted this duel as like, yes, we are sobbing. It is 4 a.m. My husband had to laugh like when we first started it. It's the same thing with BBC because he was like, why is this picture so bad? And I was like, it's BBC shot in 2008. He's like, Oh, yeah. They just have really poor film quality, even in the... And I was like, oh, yeah, no, it always looks like it's a decade older than it actually is. Also, they definitely added all of that mist, and they didn't do it in the actual morning. So it probably was just like they didn't time that right. They were like, we're going to just pipe this mist in, try to film. I was going to say something different, which I was going to guess that, like, you know, also it was... seem It seemed like it was shot on on a location like it was Mm -hmm. shot outdoors in you know around Barton Cottage at the very least which seemed like it was coastal maybe it wasn't but uh it you know there's a challenge of 
filming outdoors around the ocean. Like, you know, that's going to give you definitely a mood and make it look 10 years older than it is maybe. (laughs) For me, that's one of those like distinct, like mini series qualities. Like I honestly, like I don't, it's like if the mini series, like picture doesn't look a little fuzzy I'm like is it really a BBC miniseries right like Like if you can find a real still photo from it yeah (laughs) you guys have mentioned the director a couple times now I believe um uh, and so did did this director also do the Pride and Prejudice around the same time 13 years earlier yes yes Pride and Prejudice was 13 years earlier it have you ever seen the mini mini series with Colin Firth as Mr. Darcy yes that's the one I was talking about yeah so that was 1995 and this is 2008 Whoa, because I would, mm, because I would, I didn't have any of the same complaints for the 95 Pride and Prejudice with the cinematography. I would take a rewatch and sh- take a look at some of the shots in some of the, the some of the scenes. because so aggressively over the top. There are some crazy, crazy shots in that one. Oh, I believe that. It's just interesting, like how... And we'll get into this later about like my my feelings uh, through through this series for for this mini series. It's it's interesting then to 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 actually kind of ruminate on that and think of like wh- you know why I preferred one over the other. So yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, but maybe it was because you were watching one more critically than you were when you were watching the other one. Uh no, Kelsey, I watch everything <laughs> critically. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, come on. We're literature (laughs) podcasters over here. We're always looking for the loophole. I will say that this one in particular, Andrew Davies was like, this is not your mother's Jane Austen. It's going to be drama. It's going to be sex. And you can tell. (laughs) It's 2008. So we're having sex is what I said about it. I mean, but were they? There was like one minute at the beginning and then a kiss <laughs> at the end. I just, I'm sorry. Well, Willoughby and Marianne did kiss. There was two kisses in this. So that's Raunchy by Jane Austen standards. Okay, yeah. Oh my God. I forgot about that kiss. How inappropriate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, though, <laughs> the next morning after the duel at breakfast, Mrs. Jennings is like talking about the party and no one is responding about the party. And she's like, well, what's going on? And then Foot comes in and he's so excited to be like, I have a letter from Miss Marianne Dashwood. Poor Foot. He's like, you finally have a letter, lady. Yeah, like you've been waiting for this for so long. And she takes it and she leaves. And Mrs. Jennings is like, well, I hope there's nothing wrong between them. Just a lover's tiff. And Eleanor says, Marianne and Willoughby are not lovers. And Mrs. Jennings says, and the moon is made of green cheese. (laughs) Iconic. Yep. Then Eleanor goes up and Marianne shows her the letter. And she says, it's even worse than she thought. It's as if I never knew him. And it's really sad. And the letter says what we all know the letter says, which is that he never loved her. And he's been engaged to someone else for quite some time now. And Marianne is just like, she doesn't understand Eleanor is like, well, at least your engagement wasn't long standing. And Marianne's like, we were never engaged at all. And sh- and then Eleanor is like, well, did he say he loved you? And Marianne's like, he knew I loved him. and Or he knew I loved him. And everything he did made me think he loved me. You must believe me, Eleanor. And Eleanor's like, I do. We all believe you, Marianne. I love this scene with Kate Winslet. I'm not pitting these against each other. But what I like about the writing of this scene versus the writing of the scene with Kate Winslet is that she says, you you do believe me, Eleanor, as if like she's trying to convince her and herself that it wasn't all in her head. She's like, you you saw it too, right? Which I guess like it's implicit in the Kate Winslet scene and it's implicit in her performance. And obviously Kate Winslet is phenomenal, but I just, I love both Marianne's. Um, and I think she does a really good job with this scene. Then she like scatters her letters and she's like, I want to leave. It's like, I, I was only here for Willoughby. And at that point, Mrs. Jennings comes in with a glass of wine and she's like, it's all over town. Uh, he's to be married to Miss Gray with 50,000 pounds. And Marianne is like, oh, no. And Eleanor is like, you have to control yourself. And then Marianne turns to her and goes, happy, Eleanor. You have no idea what I suffer. And then Eleanor does her best incredulous face. She's like, are you kidding me? And then she does the wine like a shot. Oh, I loved it. I was like, you take that shot of wine, girl. You deserve it. (laughs) Yeah, that was maybe the most relatable part of the whole thing, right? Yes. (laughs) And that was also, that's a part in the book that, happens Mrs. Jennings I was so excited for this because Mrs. Jennings brings the wine in the book and is like does Marianne want this and Eleanor's like no but I'll take it and like (laughs) drinks it all and I turned to Becca when we were reading this part and I was like is Eleanor about to get drunk in this Regency era novel and I was so glad that that made it in to the actual 
filmed version. <laughs> so later, Eleanor comes downstairs and finds Marianne staring out the window. And Marianne is like, will you write to Mama? Oh, no, there's Colonel Brandon. I got to go. And she runs away. And Brandon then tells the whole story. I want to say one thing about this guy, David Morrissey, that I don't like as much as Alan Rickman, which I'm coming to terms with as the, the longer we go on, is that he's too good at telling stories. Like, Colonel Brandon is notoriously bad at telling stories. And he just, like, launches right in and is like, I'm here with the drama. I'm ready to go. This scene is just so good when Alan Rickman does it. I do like David Morrissey's Colonel Brandon. I do think he does a good job. But I do think he falls short on this scene a little bit. Yeah. He brings too much, like, melodrama to it. It is super melodramatic. He's like, she is but 15 years old. And she has by now born his child. And we're like, okay, th- you could tell this a little bit less like intensely. It's terrible because like Marianne's so young and he's like, and she's but 15. And my husband's like, dude, you want to bang the 17 year old? <laughs> it's awful. But it's just so funny because I think, and this is something I can say about the older sense and sensibility in this one. Marianne really did seem so young in this version of it versus like in the old, like, cause I've seen, I haven't seen it in for a while, but I've seen the 1995 sense and Bil- sense of sensibility and I loved it. And, but for me, like Marianne and Colonel Brandon, like it wasn't such a big gap in my head and maybe it, like just because the actors didn't seem so apart in age, even if maybe it was mentioned versus like, they make a point. He's like, he's only 35. And I'm, and she's like not even 18 yet. And I'm like, and as someone who reads a lot of Regency romance where like there are big age gaps and like 10 year age gaps really aren't that crazy, you know, or even 20 year in some cases, but it's like, they make a point of it. And then when he's like, she's but 15 and my husband's like, bro, (laughs) that's fascinating because Kate Winslet was I think she was like 18 or 19 when she filmed that and Alan Rickman was in his 40s and like to me David Morrissey and Charity Wakefield seem a lot closer in age than those two did but in any event in in either of them it's still weird that he's making such a big deal about 15 when um, I think more we can say she's unmarried and she's not even out yet like right like 15 is young but again like two years really doesn't make that big a difference and it's more just the fact that Willoughby seduced a virgin who was like not even out yet like Mm -hmm. away from her chaperone like that's 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 not okay and I think we can also assume that at the time because it has to have been at least nine nine or ten months ago now uh she might have been 14 yeah which is a little creepier which is creepier yeah for sure but it's just very interesting and I think that like, and I don't know, because maybe when I saw the 1995, I was also younger. So like, it didn't matter that Kate Winslet was actually young and Alan Rickman was older because I'm like, those are adults. I am now in my 30s and I still look at these actors and it's like, it's funny because I see them and I know they're not that actually much older. They're still like, they're in their late 30s compared to my early 30s. But because they were so much older than I was like a preteen or a teenager, I'm like, those are adults and I am not an adult. <laughs> Yeah. And the age difference is always going to be a little bit weird. But what we've talked about on this show before is that Colonel Brandon isn't weird about it. Like he's not weirdly sexual about it like Willoughby is. No, no, no. It's not. Yeah. I will say like he genuinely like that feels like a more authentic time of the period. Like he's an older gentleman. Like he needs to get married. You know, there's reason why debutantes came out and coming out at 17 versus 18 really wasn't like unheard of or 15 in Lydia's case yeah and we've talked about this before on the pod but like the the age difference between Colonel Brandon and Marianne doesn't feel as problematic just because like Colonel Brandon does so much seeding of power to Marianne Mm -hmm. you can tell he genuinely cares for her he genuinely has affection but it's not like creepy chemistry it's just like I like it's a it's not like a passionate love it's more like a growing caring kind of love which I think has so much equal value and can provide such a happy life for someone. Like, and in fact, in that case is passionate love burns out versus like that sort of growing love can be more long lasting. Absolutely. And I mean, his history too is also like, there's, there's a reason why he's attracted to a, to a woman like Marianne, right? Like he tells you that like he, he knew a woman like her once who he was in love with and he, 
he just like admires that spirit and wants to protect that spirit and wants to nurture it and let it flourish, not, you know, have sex with it and dump it. So, yeah, right. Yeah, I did turn to my girlfriend while we were watching this and I was like, is it weird that I like that he just wants to take care of her? And she was like, um, like maybe a little bit. I don't know. But like, I was like, <laughs> it was just like, I don't know. There was something about when he caught her and he was glaring at Willoughby in, at the ball. I was like, yeah, I just couldn't help. But in my head, be like, daddy. Oh, yeah. Ah! <laughs> but like, uh, you know, it's just like big, like, but like caring daddy vibes. I don't know. I can't. I'm going to stop myself right here and move on. So. Later, Eleanor tells Marianne the story. We don't get her telling the story. That's something that happens a lot in this adaptation is that, like, they skip over the actual thing that's happening and we see the reactions. And Eleanor just says, I'm so sorry, Marianne. And Marianne just kind of stares into the distance about it. Then we cut back to the cottage with Mrs. Dashwood and Margaret. And Margaret is, like, trying to learn all the kings and queens. And she keeps getting distracted and is like, who are you writing to? Are you writing to Marianne? Are you telling her to come home? And Mrs. Dashwood's like, I'm actually telling her not to come home. And Margaret's like, because everything will remind her of him. And Mrs. Dashwood's like, yes, list your kings and queens. And she goes through her kings and queens. And then she's like, Willoughby's a scoundrel, isn't he, mama? And then she says, if I was a brother instead of a sister, I would fight Willoughby and kill him with my sword. And then Mrs. Dashwood says, then it is a good thing you are not because I would hate to see you hang for murder. <laughs> That's such a good, it was so great because I love Meg. So bloodthirsty. So yes. bloodthirsty. The sword fighting Meg of the 95 will forever uh, be in my heart. Then she like gets down to the meat and potatoes about the economics of dating in Jane Austen. And she says. Ram the sound effect. Yes. She says uh, men get to go and do things and girls just sit and wait for things to happen. And she doesn't like that. She's a little feminist. Then. We cut to Fanny talking with Robert and John at their dinner table and gossiping. And she's like, you know, only a fool would turn down the prospect of 50,000 pounds. And I think it's funny that she says that because um, then Robert is like, yeah, I should say so. But then he ends up with Lucy, who doesn't have any money at all. Mm-hmm. Oh, but he already has the money. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he does. Ugh. So he's like, oh, I have all the money. Now I can, because like, I, I don't know. I and mean, they don't do a good job. We already said this in, in this version with this Lucy, maybe. But like Lucy has the the skills that he probably wants, like for ascending and for, you know, being conniving and getting your social status and da, 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 da. So like she she has she has a, a, a valid skill set for him. True. I think. Yeah, that's very true. Then John is like, well, we I want to like do something for the girls, at least for Eleanor which is something I don't know if it happens in the book, if that conversation happens, but then they start scheming and we're going to get to like what they're scheming later on. But then we cut to Brandon coming to visit little Eliza and the baby. And she says she, she's afraid like what's going to become of them. And Brandon says he's going to make sure they don't want for anything. And Eliza's like, well, what if, what if like, what if we could just see him one more time? Like maybe seeing his child would you know, maybe it would change his mind. And Brandon's like, absolutely not. He's engaged. And she looks so heartbroken. That was such a heartbreaking scene. Like, she's like, yeah. And she's like, but but what if he just saw his kid? And it's like, no, honey, no. He doesn't care. I was really glad, though, that we got to see Colonel Brandon say the truth. Like, not sugarcoat it, but basically be like, here's where this stops. Like, he's engaged. And it's not, like, th this is not going to change anything for him. And I was just glad that he was honest with her in that moment. And I do think this adaptation centers Willoughby a little bit more mm -hmm. than um, than 95 does. And part of that is showing his crimes. And it the scene is sort of a reminder that no matter how badly Willoughby treated Marianne, how dire her circumstances are, he has committed such egregious crimes such that his crimes against Marianne are almost like not even as bad. Yeah, which is it's we cut directly to Marianne and you're like, it causes you to relate what he did to Eliza and what he did to Marianne because we cut to her like playing the piano and John talking with Eleanor and John is saying like, Eleanor, you should go for Brandon because you're 
still able to catch a man if you like wanted to. Poor Marianne. She's got no chances now. She's all washed out, which is she's right there, first of all. And that's your sister, second of all. So maybe take a step back. John. John was just so he just lacks so much backbone. Like the opening scene where he's like, well, I'd like to do something for the girls. And his wife is like, really, really? And he's like, I guess I don't need to. And I'm like, just have a backbone. Like your dad would have wanted it. What the hell? They're your sisters. Yeah, he's a weenie. I don't feel like he he lacked a backbone. I think that he just actually wasn't a good person. And so Fanny would say the thing he wanted to hear. Fair enough. Like that. That's kind of how I took it. Mm -hmm. I was just like, he actually doesn't want to do this. Um, And that's why, like, at least in this version, I think he lacked a backbone maybe in, in the other versions. But in this version, I felt like he actually didn't really want to. And so like Fanny's like arguments were like the perfect excuse for him. And then also when it came to the end and he was like, I want to do something for the girls. You were like, wait, where did this come from? I think if I would have expected your character to have put it out of your mind forever at this point. I I think he has like just like inklings of guilt still Mm. for completely disinheriting them. And it's manifesting in him being like, I won't provide for you, but why don't I try to set you up with a man who's clearly willing to? Right. Yeah, totally. Fair enough. And then he's, he tells her, um, by the way, like, you should stop setting your sights on Edward because his mom is totally determined that he's going to marry Miss Morton. And that's when he invites them to dinner because he's like, oh, the colonel will be there and Mrs. Ferris will be there. So, like, this is all good stuff for you. And then we go to dinner at his house and the Steels are there also. And the, Lucy is so excited to be meeting Mrs. Ferrers because she's like, uh, this is the woman upon whom all my further my future happiness depends and blah, 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 blah. We get to dinner. There's a bowl of fruit with gold on it. There was so much gold everywhere. Like everything the woman ate like had to be gilded. Like I was like, this is ridiculous. I didn't notice the bowl of fruit with gold. I guess I only noticed like the gold flakes of on the almonds that she was eating afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> there was that too. No, but even in the bowl of fruit, it had like gold, it had like gold foil like on like Which flakes was so, of it Which so, like there. I can't imagine that feels good going on your teeth. But the almonds was, I actually laughed out loud because it looked like a bowl of little gold rocks. And then she just like eats it mm-hmm. and the shock factor. I was like, oh, that was food. <laughs> but at dinner, she eats one of her little gold fruits and she is very Lady Catherine de Bourgh. And even on later on, there's like a zoom in onto her face that felt very like in the 1995 Pride and Prejudice when Lady Catherine is like all five out at once. And it like zooms in on her face so dramatically. Um, I don't I wrote down when this was. Uh, so I'll get to it. But whatever she was saying, it was like intense. And that's how Andrew Davies likes to direct those moments at dinner. They're talking about Willoughby and his like marriage to Miss Gray. And Marianne is like super uncomfortable and Brandon notices and he changes the subject and he asks if Edward is joining them. And then he looks at Marianne and they smile at each other like they have this little understanding and it made my heart flutter. Then Mrs. Ferrer starts talking about Miss Morton. And I felt bad at this moment because Eleanor then gets really uncomfortable. But Brandon didn't know when bringing up Edward that that was going to make Eleanor sad because he doesn't know that she is in love with him. And he's just trying to help. Then Sir John asks Robert if he likes fishing and everything. And this is another moment of Robert being a little bit grody with his flirting with Lucy. But he's like, I don't like country sports, but country manners can be pleasing. And he like looks at Lucy. Oh, yeah. It was like, oh, does he lick his lips again in this moment? There's something gross. There's something where you're just like, oh, yeah, I think he does. For some reason in the like BBC versions, when there's a sleazy character, they like up the sleazy like crazy. It's like we get it. And in response to that, Anne is like, I hope you don't think we're country bumpkins, which I love. I love her. I love how confrontational she is and she says you know like your brother likes the country just fine like he's always very happy when he's with us isn't he Anne and Anne is like I don't know how or not Anne Lucy is and Lucy is like I don't know how I would know what you're talking about like I I I don't know how he feels what are you talking about Anne and Anne's like oh okay but then Marianne is like well I heard him say he was never happier than when he was with us at Norland oh Marianne (laughs) And then Mrs. Ferrers is like, that's enough of that. And she gets up and walks into the other room. 
And Lucy starts sucking up to her and like puts a pillow behind her back. Oh, yeah. And, like, I saw the big suck up there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's perfect because Mrs. Ferris is just nice enough to give Lucy some like affirmation, but also so like you don't exist as a person to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then Fanny starts being like, oh, like Marianne, you want to play the piano? Look, mom, look at Eleanor's paintings. But she's really trying to get her to say that Miss Morton is better at all these things. Mm-hmm. And that is exactly what she does. And Marianne gets annoyed. She's like, you're talking about Eleanor's paintings right now. Why are you talking about Miss Morton? And she takes the painting from them and she goes to Eleanor and she's like, don't let them make you unhappy. And then she bursts into tears and starts hyperventilating, which happens in the book. And it it didn't make sense then and it doesn't make sense now. But she's just like (laughs) sitting amongst them crying. And Miss uh, Ferrers is like, what is wrong with her? And she said she seems a little unhinged. And then Fanny turns to her mom and she goes, Willoughby. And that is where we will end this episode of Pod and Prejudice. We have yet again, it, I, I will say for our listeners, it was bold of us to think that we could do these episodes in two parts each. Um, so we're going to break this one into three parts as well uh, for a second time. But <laughs> thank you, Zoe and Kelsey, so much for joining us on this episode. Do you want to tell our listeners where they can find you on the internet? Yes. Uh, Thanks again for having us. We've been having a lot of fun with this conversation. Um, If you are interested, our podcast is everywhere you find podcasts. And we are Tea and Strumpets. Our website is romancepod.com. And we are on all the social media. uh, T is in Tom, N is in Nancy, Strumpets. I love the T is in Tom, N is in Nancy because every time I'm on the phone and I have to think of how to like think of the, the the words that the letters of my name are associated with, I blank every time. And I'm like, M is in Molly. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we were like tried for a while to come up with something clever that would be like T as in teapot. But that was like, no. And like we were trying to like have something Regency related. And then we we're like N, N as in yeah, okay, Nancy. <laughs> like it was just, it just and we've just been doing it ever since. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you for joining us again. And listeners, we thank you for listening. Uh, we appreciate you joining us for so long on these episodes. I can't wait for the next episode, though. Gosh, I have so many thoughts and feelings about this this. And I just can't wait to like unleash them all. So I hope uh, people join us for the next the next episode, too, because I can't wait. <laughs> yes. As our listeners know, the final episode of anything is always where all of the feelings come out. We we talk about our favorite parts. So you just have to stick around for one more. And um, I mean, what a delight it's been to have you two on. So I think that everyone's going to be really excited for the next episode. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, my gosh. Thanks so much for being here. And until next time, stay proper and find yourself a Colonel Brandon who will catch you as you swoon. Ah! Yes, that's exactly the correct one for this. (laughs) Great job, Kelsey. Pod and Prejudice is edited by Molly Burdick and audio produced by Graham Cook. Our show art is designed by Torrance Brown. Our show is transcribed by Speech Docs Podcast Transcription. For transcripts and to learn more about our team, check out our website at podandprejudice.com. To keep up with the show, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pod and Prejudice. If you love what you hear, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash podandprejudice to see how you can support us, or just drop us a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Pod and Prejudice is sponsored this week by Romantically Written. Check them out at romanticallywritten.com or on Instagram at romanticallywrittenletters. And be sure to use our code HOMST, that's W-H-O-M-S-T, at checkout for 10% off your subscription. Thanks for listening.